Well, it's that time of year again, the favorite time of year for us vendors. The time of year where people been, that have been setting aside the discretionary income actually start letting a little bit of it go. The holiday season for us art vendors and art markets, farmers markets, that kind of stuff, is where you're going to make the majority of your yearly income. In fact, I know some personal uh, acquaintances, woodworking friends, that spend their entire year doing nothing but building up their inventory so that they will have enough to sell in these last eight weeks of the year. Well, if you're doing that kind of deal, it's always nice to have a few impulse of stuff to buy. Stuff in the five to twenty dollar range, and this is also a price range where if you are a woodworker and you have a long Christmas list of gifts you need to fill up, hey, a weekend of work and you can fill most of them and not spend too much money. These are the kind of items that you don't spend a lot of time investment in it, and the parts uh, or the materials are readily available and fairly cheap. One of my favorites to do this time of year are tree ornaments because they're somewhat universally uh, accepted as office gifts and stuff like that. Just don't make them too religious themed. So today, let me show you some of my favorite ornaments to make for this time of year in order to boost sales. Now this year I'm focusing on four different styles of ornaments. I'm going to have my apprentice working on some pendant styles, and I'll, sh I'll give you an overview of those. But in this video, I'm really going to focus on finial style ornaments, turning very nice shaped finials. And if you use this as a practice exercise, you'll be able to transfer this kind of art form into box tops or chair or a box uh, legs or various artworks or accessories to your other woodworking. The techniques you will be practicing here transfer all over the place. And I've always said this, if you want to be good at wood turning, first get good at spindle turning. Because good spindle turners seem to be able to do all different types of wood turning, but people like bowl turners and box makers, they have a harder time transitioning to spindles. Spind learning spindles and the tool control required to do these well is the key to just about all other styles of wood turning. And we're going to be focusing on three different types of ornaments with this finial design. Something I call icicles, which are just the basic finials. Then something I call pinks, which basically uses one finial and a tiny pink sea urchin, a seashell. And these you can buy by the box uh, all over the place. Just search sea urchins ornament uh, and you can buy them anywhere. And then my favorite ones are a two-piece finial that I used with these Spucknik style sea urchins. And these are my most popular sellers and the highest price ones. They make great gifts and I have a lot of customers that come back to me year after year to buy a new ornament. Kind of, they kind of celebrate each year with a new ornament for the tree. And these have become extremely popular with them. But the first thing I need to get do is get my apprentice started working on those pendants. Now people always seem kind of perplexed when they come to the shop and they see my apprentice over in the corner just buzzing away. Yes, I kind of jokingly refer to my little inexpensive DIY CNC machine as my apprentice. Because like an apprentice, you supply materials, you give it a few instructions, and then you send it on its way. And it will do work while I go about on the lathe or with my hand tools making the more profitable stuff. This is the kind of item that turns out those $5 to $10 items that are impulse buys. People don't really expect a lot of labor involved in them. And if you just think it through, you can give them a really good quality product. To get this thing working though, I first need to prep a bunch of material. And because I'm a hand to a woodworker, I'm always thinking three steps ahead. I don't want to do the same operation twice. So what I would do is I will take a bunch of boards, I will flatten one side over the jointer to make them nice and smooth. Probably the last time I'll touch that side. And then I'll bandsaw a thickness out uh, and it'll give a nice rough finish on the top. I don't worry about that. I'm going to glue, take these down, let the machine do the carving, and then I will sand them smooth. Because I'm going to have to sand them after the carving anyway, so why do the same step twice? 
you got general woodworking rules that you have from one side that you all can always apply to another branch of woodworking. So, I'm going to take a little bit of time, prep this machine, and then we'll get on to turning some finials. Now, every woodworker I know has some kind of scrap bin. You know, you have a nice curly piece of wood, but look at that. What am I going to make out of it? It's just, it's, it is firewood, but we spend so much time or money in acquiring it, it just hurts to throw it away. Well, this is the kind of project where we're going to start burning through all that old kind of off cuts. And, you know, you collect it all through the year, thinking that, hey, these will make great pen blanks or something like that. Well, we still haven't made pens out of it, so now it's time to put it to good use and get some money out of it. Now, I can't stress this enough. What we're going to be doing today will translate to all your other woodworking. And think of it as five to ten minute exercises that you can get a little money from your, for your effort, but later on down the line, you will have the skill that's just going to translate to anything. I mean, turning a fine bead like that, or a little cove, or a nice finial straight line, you might not think it translates to big bowl design, but the skill you need to pick up your line as you're going through a nice curve, this is where you practice it. The skill you need to turn a very fine bead on the outside of a bowl, this is where you learn and practice it. I mean, you're going to be blasting through these, making maybe $5 per, but you're not going to be spending more than 5 or 10 minutes on them, And but you're going to get the practice, and I can't stress that enough. Now let's start out talking about making those icicles, because they are a purely skill-based product. All you're doing is showing off what you can do with your tools. And it'll give me a chance to talk about the techniques and tools and how I sharpen them and how I use them. Then those skills will transfer her into making both the pinks and those little Sputnik sea urchins. So, I'm going to be using my uh, mini lathe uh, for this one, because this is really all the power you need for this kind of project. And if you want to use a tailstock, you can. I'm also going to be using a unique kind of jump, uh, jaws on just these icicles. They grip small square pieces. I don't know what they are called, pendant styles or what, but you can buy the jaws to attach to a whole bunch of different styles of um, chucks. And this is one of those demos I do in live demonstrations just because it's fairly quick and easy. Now the main tools I'm going to be using when I do this are my roughing gouge. It's a standard roughing gouge. This is spindle turning and this is a very safe tool for spindle turning. But warning, you never want to use this with a bowl because bowls have end grain, long grain, end grain, long grain and basically in spindles all you're ever doing is going with the grain so you're never fighting that end grain. Uh, it's safe, but going transition between the end and long grain, it's not so much that if you get a catch, it'll be really bad, but there's a lot of vibration going on, and this kind of tool is made out of a flat bar. And if you've ever taken a piece of metal and just moved it back and forth like that, they will snap. So there's a lot of bending that goes on right here, a lot of force at this flat portion where it goes into the finial. So these things can bend and break, when you're using them with a bowl gouge. So this is a, the industry is kind of wanting us to call these spindle roughing gouges because of the way they are made. Don't use them in anything other than a spindle. The other tools, I tend to use a three quarter inch uh, skew on this one and I will show you why and how I cut this uh, angle right there uh, a little bit later. And I will be using two spindle gouges. My standard half inch one with a swept back wings. I grind it off of a uh, Wolverine jig. And this is a radically swept back that they call it more of a detail gouge. And I don't use it for too many cuts, but when I do need it, it is really nice to have. And this I think is a uh, 3 8 inch rubber sorby one, which I don't use it very often, so decent enough for what it is. I will also sometimes use this little parting tool. Uh, basically, you just sharpen up the bottom. 
I'm not a big fan of it for the simple reason that my tool rest is iron, it's not steel, and this steel will sometimes dent it. Uh, it it's wise to break these edges on the back so it's not as aggressive. But you, if you, you see me pulling out a parting tool, it'll probably be this very thin one. The material we're going to be using for this first icicle is a piece of uh, curly maple. And when I'm in my shop, I basically keep my bandsaw set up so it's nice and square. So I can grab a piece of scrap, come over, set it to its width, and cut me out squares. And having squares are really important with the type of jaws we are using on our chuck. It is also important to have it nice and uh, 90 degrees on end, so I cut them to length on my chop saw uh, to make sure that's going to be safe. Now, something that's important, don't do all of your icicles in the same species. People like variations in color and it will show better. That's why using your scraps is so good, is because you're going to have a wide variety of different types of wood. I'm just using this hard maple right now, curly maple, because it's the first thing that's out there, and the lighter color will probably show up against my darker shirt in the video. No other reason than that. Okay, the reason why it's so important to get a nice square end on your blanks is because you're going to be shoving them all the way down to the base. Wind it up. The triangles of your blanks are going to go in between each one of these giant teeth, but you want to push it in. I, it's very tempting to come out and stretch it out on the end, but if you look at the jaws, you can see that the squeezing mechanism squeezes it in through here, not out here. Out here it can get some torque on it. So having the blank go all the way to this base right here means it's getting most of its tension right there. These longer teeth right there just add a lot of stability as you're turning farther and farther out. So you really want to be able to push this chuck in really hard against the base to get a nice stable blank. Now having that stability is why I feel confident in being able to turn this from start to finish without that tailstock. So if you want to put the tailstock on for the very beginning, feel free. Uh, I'm just going to be taking very light cuts at high speed, so I, I'm confident in it. Also, my, I've measured this out to about five and a half inches, and that's about the max size I do for my finials that I'm giving away at this price range. And I marked that out on my uh, chop saw using a marker right on the bed. And that's kind of my standard size for things like tops and blanks and stuff like that. It's just what I do. If you want to go longer, you can, but you're going to have to take a lot more of a delicate touch as you're turning, and it's not really going to increase the value that much. A four inch ornament for a tree, that's just fine. Now the first tool we're going to be using is that spindle roofing gouge I was talking about earlier. And in my shop, I have two of these slow speed grinders. They're not much money, so it's a nice investment to have. And I have two platforms. This first platform I set up for just my scrapers, so it's always there. I can quickly touch up any tool. The second one I have up at about 40 degrees, and I never really touch it because a lot of my tools use that angle. For example, this roughing gouge. So whenever I want to sharpen it, I just quickly come over, I put it in line with the grinding stone, I start at one side, I work my way across, keeping it flat on the platform, and my goal is to keep it nice and flat here. Now for a roughing gouge, what we just did right there is perfectly fine. I think that stone is 80 grit, but I'm not 100% sure, but it'll work just great. But when I'm out in the field, even on my roughing gouge, you will see me hone quite a bit. I keep a little diamond stone, uh, a slip stone, right by my lathe all the time, and you will see me sharpening it quite often if you see a lot of demonstrations of mine or out at the markets. And so I want to show you that my technique for sharpening these things in the field, and it also gets a much, much keener edge, because this right here is a worn down 600 grit diamond stone. So it's probably more equivalent to 1200 grit now. Now I want to show you this honing technique with this roughing gouge because it's a lot easier to see the results. You see how I have a slight shiny spot on the base and one right on the edge. That's because I just honed it with this stone. And the way I do that one is I will put the stone on the bottom bevel and I will get it moving. And that will never leave this bottom bevel. And then I will rotate my blade up so that every like fourth or fifth go back and forth it will just kiss that blade, though it will never 
leave that bottom bevel. And what that does is it prevents you from rolling over the edge and either increasing the edge angle or dulling it. Just keep it on that base bevel and you will keep your same angle. Then I'll take the inside of it and I'll hone off the burr on the inside. Now this is very easy to do on something like the roughing gouge because you have a base bevel here and a, that your edge right there. But when you start talking about your finely ground spindle gouges, you notice I have multiple bevels on my spindle gouge. So I'm not actually uh, moving off of this bottom bevel, I'm moving off this other bevel that's way up, maybe two thirds of the way up. That creates a shorter distance here, it allows me to turn tighter turns. So when I'm honing this one, it takes a little bit more skill, but it's something if you start doing it, maybe the first time or two you won't get perfect results, but after that, it just kind of gets second nature. and You can kind of feel that clack, 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 clack of rocking between that base bevel and your edge. Okay, so let's get turning. Now, today I'm going to be talking about, I'm not going to call it intermediate level skills. I'm going to talk about maybe the orange and green belt style skills. If you're still at the white belt level, I suggest you pause this video now and go watch my wood turning demystified, where I explain a lot of the physics of how your tools work in this lay situation, especially with spindle turning, and that'll cover, go in a lot more details if you're at that white belt level. But today I'm kind of assuming you have some of those basic skills and we're going to go on from there. Now, if you're in a live situation, I suggest at this point in time when you're roughing stuff out, you're in that point where you want to draw people's attention into your booth, so you want to make some noise. So roughing stuff out at this level, there is a technique to make a little bit more noise and still keep it safe. I'm going to actually start at the end and make minor end cuts, just removing these edges and because of the way it's configured, it kind of makes a vibration sound. And then you can crank up the speed and make a smoothing cut as the crowd comes in here. It's a good way to draw attention because they want to find out what you're doing. So, turn up your speed. I have a variable speed over on my hand over on this side. So I can turn it up fast or slow. Turn it up as fast as you feel comfortable. I do have it in the high gear on my lathe. I come over, touch the tool desk down. I'm going to start on the end. I'm actually taking very light cuts because I want, don't want to do this too fast and I am hanging out over quite a bit at this point in time. You can get a lot more aggressive the farther in you go. So come over here, very light touch, just take off the corner. And notice I'm taking these short cuts, short and fast. Makes a big mess. Now this is not the fastest way to do it, but if you're doing it in front of a live crowd, it kind of draws their attention. Then come over, if you're wanting to block sha the shavings, put your hand on top of this stage, and just move your body back and forth. Now notice what part of the gouge I'm working off right now. I'm working off some of the center. But when I come to the edge where I want to start doing a fine, finer cut, I'll start out 90 degrees to it, raise it up to the, see the shavings coming off, and I'll tank it over a little bit and angle it. And notice the kind of shavings I'm now getting. And you want to take light cuts. Now what I explained right there is really only about 15-20 seconds of work when I'm not talking. Gets you a nice finish. Now that we got the blank prep, let's go to the whiteboard and talk about design. So, in my opinion, finials and finial designs and their execution are an art form all unto themselves in the wood turning world. And you add an elegant finial to the top of a really nice box maybe some burled, wild edge, live edge kind of thing. And the finial centers it, gives you some place to grab and lift the lid, but it just kind of flows up into the heavens. I mean, it just brings everything together when it's done very well. And people like Cindy Droz, I think she's the most well-known out there that do these kind of things. I mean, it is an art form in and to itself. And the skills required, yes, they translate elsewhere, but they're very specialized skills. The problem is, this kind of finial will not survive our environment or the environment your customers are buying it in. 
They're going to be putting it in a tree. They're going to be taking that tree down, wrapping them up, putting them in storage. They'll become in and out over 10, 15 years. They're going to have to be displayed in your booth. You're going to unwrap them and wrap them probably a dozen times before they sell, very likely. The abuse this fine, elegant thing will take, this one would break. Okay? There's no round to it. And then all your time is wasted on them. So, we've got to adjust our designs of finials for our target audience and what we're trying to sell. Technically, I would call my designs when I'm doing these icicles or sea urchin styles somewhat clunky, somewhat thick, but I don't have to keep remaking them. I don't have to throw them away because they break or some kid knocks over a display and I lose a whole year's worth of inventory uh, because they are so delicate. So, my designs, when I do these for our merchant stuff like that, I basically think of three components in my finials, and I don't gussy them up too much. Those three components start with the head of the item. And the head of it is basically the transition from whatever object you have, whether it be a sea urchin, a hollow form wood design, or just the screw on the top of it that transitions down to hold it. The head of the dog, the head of the finial is just that transition. And a lot of times it involves the joinery aspect of your finial. Okay? After that you have the main body. You don't want to be too busy in the main body. It's just kind of to elongate the design and flow. Bring the whatever design elements you have in the transition from the main piece down to the tail of the document. And yes, you can get really wild in there. You can make it really fancy. I found one or two elements is all you need and people will appreciate the design. They'll spend money on it and you don't have to waste time adding more elements. And then you have the tail. On the tails, I like to do different types of shapes, but what I don't like to do is bring it to that nice, elegant point. Those will get destroyed all the time, even wrapping it up in tissue paper. You don't know how many times I've actually snapped one of those ends off. This one right here, even in just doing this video, I accidentally bent the end. And there's no way to fix that other than a knife, which is going to leave facets, or taking a piece of sandpaper and sanding it down like that, which ruins all the other elements. I hate to say it, I've pretty much ruined this if somebody's looking in it quite detailed. So, I try not to do extended points. I ne You will never see a design that I'm selling in a market coming down to a long, thin, elegant finial and terminating there. It just doesn't happen. They will not survive. But there are a lot of other things you can do that will add interest. One of my more common ones for the tail design is adding a little acorn. Those are kind of elegant. And they come to a point, but it's not a delicate point. The other fun things, you can do a wine bottle. That's got a nice flat edge on the base. Comes up, and maybe up here in the body of it, the transition, you do a wine glass. I mean, you can have fun with these. Just don't get overly complicated and take into mind the delicateness of them. So with that in mind, the first thing we're going to be working on is the tail of it with the body being here and then my transition to the head right there. The reason why you work on the tail first is because we are going to be getting thin and having this extra meat right here is great support for that one. It reduces your vibration. Once I finish the tail, I will not come back to it. I will do all my sanding and everything before I move on to the body. So the, the three main tools I will be using are my two spindle gouge, and this will probably do 90% of the work, and my skew gouge. I'm going to show you how I sharpen my spindle gouges now, and I'll show you the skews a little bit later. So for my main spindle gouge, I come over and I have one of these little one-way jigs I set up one time. I've never reset it since that original time. I drop it in here, and pretty much when I'm doing my Wolverine setup, this is the one jig I use for all the same spindle. I drop it into this overpriced hole, which sets the extension out to about two inches. 
I come over to my higher grip wheel, I check to make sure my line is in the right spot on my bar, turn it on, and then just rotate it from one side to the other. And I kind of concentrate on the wings a little bit more than the tip, because the tip gets moved over quite a bit. But if you notice, now my bevel is extended down quite a bit. So what I want to do is I want to bring it back a little bit. And what I'll do is just loosen this up and extend it out a little bit. How much I extend it out, I don't really know. I don't really care. All this is doing is getting rid of the metal below the, below the uh, bevel so I can make tighter turns. Now my bevel is quite a bit shorter. Now my detail spinning gouge, I do freehand because I just haven't found a jig that would do it consistently. And when you go freehand, there's a lot of variable. The reason why I use a Wolverine setup for my uh, main spindle gouge is because this thing right here, I have more difficulty with than any tool I have. I, I get more catches with my spindle gouge than I even do my skewed chisel. Uh, I know I'm kind of weird that way. So I want the consistency on it, and as far as spindle gouges, this is the one that's in my tool all the time. I go through about two of these a year, um, so go there. Now, I am a huge fanboy of Thompson Steel. Uh, I am not a huge fanboy, but he doesn't do his groove out so far. So you can wear these things out fairly quickly if you're using the Wolverine setup because you kind of need it to protrude through there a certain amount and after you get past that flute you don't have those two flats anymore so you'll see a lot of turners with the Thompson stuff because it's so short we will actually start grinding back and getting a flat going farther back so that we can use more of the tool because I mean I still have a good two inches two or three inches left in this thing but my Wolverine setup wouldn't go back any farther so just another tip now, when I freehand uh, sharpen these, it's basically a U shape. And I, I don't know what the exact angle is. It's actually fairly steep, as you can see. And my wings are way swept back. I don't know. If, can we focus in on that? Maybe not. Wings are way swept back. If I do that one with a U shape, I start on the side and I'll come down and feed my way up. So the idea is I will kind of eyeball where I want the bevel to be, it's right about there on my bowl gouge. Get in kind of position, that will be the bottom of the spot I, I sharpen with. And then I'm going to come up the wing on the side, and then just kind of freehand it down to that point in a U fashion. So I come over, starting on the side of the wing, come down, Roll the tool over to right about that spot, and then roll it up. And then when I want to remove the back of it, I just use it, rotate it around to remove that seal. You end up with a nice shape. Mine's a little pointy right now, so I can come back in and roll it around. So that's how you can freehand sharpen these if you want to. I do that one for my spin, my uh, detail spinning gouge, simply because I don't have a jig that can get this shape I like. So back to the lathe. On this first one, I'm going to start out by making a small acorn on the bottom. And am I planning these out? Not really. I'm batching these icicles out, so I just have a few design elements, and I'll just kind of mix and match as I go along. We're going to start out with that acorn first. Now one of the design criteria I try to follow is, you know, we have our tail, we have our body, and then we have the head. None of these three elements I want to have at the same thickness. So there's either a kind of curve coming out, curve going down, curve coming up. And generally I like to have the head as the thickest area because I'm putting the screw in there and it, I just think it looks better. So most of the time this is going to be the medium thickness portion of it. So I'm going to real quickly bring this down a little bit so that it's not going to be the same thickness as here to begin my development. And notice 
notice I'm using the side of my wing on this thing. This is a skewing cut. Give you a nice finish, even though it's coming straight off a blade. See what I'm talking about? I should probably explain to me the, the different cuts I'm using with my tools as I... I might use terminology that doesn't make sense to a lot of people. So let's go to the whiteboard real quickly. Okay, a lot of the terminology we are using are referencing other tools. A lot of times I, I or other wood turners will say we're making a skewing cut even though we have a spindle gouge in our hands. Or you might say we're making a scraping cut even though we have a skew in our hands. It all depends upon how our, the blade is interacting with the wood. And a lot of times it's easiest just to reference the most common cut of a specific tool, maybe a skew or a scraper, in relationship to whatever you have in your hand. Now the easiest way I can explain is to go back to traditional woodworking, wood turning. If you look at a board and a plane, the blade generally interacts with the wood at about 45 degrees. Now, you know, we change those angles. If you increase it, it generally works better with uh, highly figured wood. You lower it down, it works better with softer wood. But for the most part, we're working in the 40 to 45 degree range. You push it along, the shavings come off, okay? So, if you look at our spindle tools, if we grind our spindle gouge at a 40 to 40 degree bevel, well, look at that. It's about the same angle as a hand plane as it engages the wood if we were going across it this way. But the thing is, if this is the headstock, and this is the tailstock, and this is the blank we have on our board, and it is rotating around this way, when we use something like the spindle gouge, we are constantly changing this back handle angle. If you're going this way, you engage it slightly below center. Here, let's use a cardboard example to make it a little easier to explain. You got your fingernail shape. If you're moving this way, we kind of cant the handle over and we engage it slightly below center so that it will be nice and balanced above the tool rest and we can get a nice smooth cut. But look at the angle. The wood's coming straight over here, engaging right below center. Doesn't that look pretty close to about 45 degrees? Now, a second go, I just did a skewing cut. And if you have a skewing tool, same exact thing. You engage the blade on the bottom third, which a lot of times we will kind of move it towards. And look at that angle. Roughly 45 degrees as we're shaving across. So, same exact thing. If I were to cant, take my uh, gouge, lay it on its side, and engage the blade way below center, I can still have the wood coming off at 45 degrees. So it's all about how we're presenting the tool to the edge or the direction that it engages is what we're talking about. But you need to understand, we're, this explanation is as, as if everything was in a 2D world. And we know wood is not 2D, it's 3D. So a better explanation would be a ball. And if you are engaging the wood, obviously the wood is coming off at you this way, but when you get around here, we have to change our tool angle, change our tool adjustment, change our tool approach in order to get that 45 degree interaction. So we change our cuts. I might start out with a skewing cut. I might transition into a push cut going off the bottom edge. Now why does all this matter? Well it comes down to how you're using your tools and what you feel comfortable with. Different cuts will allow you to do different things. A pushing cut with a spindle gouge, if I'm on the edge, you can see that the angle, if I'm engaging it right there, is roughly the 45 degrees we talked about. But it, the bevel angle, if you notice, that distance right there is not that long. Whereas if I were to engage it here on the blade and then have the bevel rubbing way back there, all of a sudden I have a much more stable cut. So if I were to come across this way, 
I have that longer bevel so I can make a nice smoother more gradual curve and it feels more stable whereas if I'm pushing in on this one it's like a short wheelbase sports car you can kind of it kind of wobbles around it's not as smooth a cut so using the tool I can basically just set aside what angle I want the wood to come off the blade and how far the the cutting edge is from the bevel I'm resting on as I glide it along so you can get a lot more versatile cuts plus the fact that sometimes you, it's easier just to pull out than it is to push in just depends this tool gives you a lot of flexibility but I wanted to explain these terminology I'm using I just used a skewing cut with my spindle gouge. So I'm just going to reduce it down a little bit more. Notice I'm taking a very light cut because I am hanging out off the end a little bit. You can do it at various spots on your gouge to gain that depth. Notice however I'm engaging is about the 45. So let's start doing a little acorn. I will do the base first. So I'm going to start out making a V cut. Now normally a V cut is the realm of your skew chisel. You come in, you make an indentation that basically pushes the fibers out to either side and then you come in from either side and deepen it down. But the wood doesn't know what blade you're using and I do have a tip on this thing. And just out of sheer speed or the fact that I just don't want to reach six inches over and grab my skew, I can actually use my spindle gouge to make a quick V cut to define the baseline of my acorn. So that will be the cap and this will be the base. So come back over and just slowly round it over. Few cuts. Come in here, and I'll have to come back this way to get to the base of that. Notice I'm using that push cut because it's a shorter distance right there, and I can get into that corner. Very light cut. I'm not pressing on that bevel too much at all. And then just round it over to make the base of the acorn. I don't like that little V there, so I will kind of transition it a little bit better. And there are all different kinds of acorns, so you don't have to have a perfect shape. And come out to the slightest of points at the end. Now for the cap. Once again, come in, create a relief to fall through, and then transition that down. A little bit of a line there, so I'll come back and take one final smoothing cut as best I can. There we go, we have my acorn. So if I were to sand this, which will take a quick look at it, I don't think I need to sand this one, and because this is a something I'm going to be batching out quickly. Uh, I'm just going to let it go from there. It's smooth enough to the touch. So right here is going to be my body. So I now need to figure out what kind of shape I want here. I think I'm going to add a little transition bead right there and then come up uh, and make a nice long cove. So I'll come into this direction sideways. Make the nice cut in. And then start removing material using the wing. I'm going to come in right here and I've always found that these points when you have two points coming to a V I tend to get a little bit of raggedness on maple I've learned that from the tops so if you want there's no reason why you can't create that really nice crisp line point and then come back in and see you can't ever so slightly flatten it out so it's nice and crisp. 
feel it for Christmas. Now I got a nice crisp line and I can't really sand that anymore because a crisp line, uh, sandpaper takes away crisp lines. So that's going to be the base of my curve. So now I'm just going to blend it in. Hear that squeal? That's a little vibration I'm introducing in. Okay, feel it out. Got a little bit of bubble right there, so the simple solution is to sand it. I have some 320 grit sandpaper, just light squeezing to smooth that out. Notice I do not go down to that baseline. And there we go. Now if you want a crisp line on a transition like this right here, I suggest you come back over and make that crisp line in this direction. Just come off the side and it gives you that nice transition. So for the, for the head, I think i add a little bead. enough then we need a t top cap now before you take it off Stop the lathe, make sure all your lines are really crisp. You're happy with it? See, I got a little tear out right there, and before I make it too thin, I'm gonna go clean that up. I don't quite like that one transition there, but that'll be taken care of with sandpaper. So here we go, clean this one spot up. Remember me talking about being able to pick up the line? Oops, got a little catch. I'll probably be taking care of sandpaper. Sand over the bead. And there we go. A nice little Christmas ornament. Got a little catch there. I'm going to leave that. I think it's kind of cool looking. Okay. Now, here's a key point. We're going to be adding a screw on top. A very small brass screw like that. And it's very hard in a round end to get it started. So whenever I do my caps, I kind of undercut them a little bit so it's a slight V, so this point will find a center. It makes it a lot easier to thread in. So with my skew, I'm going to clean up this one line. I think I can do a little bit better there. And then I'm going to do a V cut that's slightly undercut. pops off, just skew it off. Now I screwed up that one because I didn't quite get my V cut, so I'll take my skew, I'll make a little dimple in the end, middle. And that'll be a nice place for this screw thread to latch onto. Now if you want to, take the time to add a little friction polish, that would be very nice. But I look at these as my cheap price point items. These are the impulse buys. Uh, I'll probably sell something like this for less than $5. So I don't want to spend too much time and effort on it. And the raw wood in this kind of situation, it's good enough in my opinion. Uh, a lot of people like it that way. So there we go. Without me talking, that was a less than five minute project. And we have ourselves a nice little Christmas ornament. Uh, that'll go on the tree. Now, I'm not going to make too many more of these for this demonstration because tomorrow I have a big market and I am going to be making probably hundreds of these live in front of people. 
So I'm going to move on to the uh, pinks and show you how I integrate those sea urchins. Now I'm going to apologize real quickly because I processed all these sea urchins last year. I did about a hundred of them, of these and these. Uh, so I had a bunch of processed ones left over. So I'm going to describe how I did it and I'll show you the tools I did, but I can't demonstrate it because uh, I didn't want to repurchase another hundred of these just for the video. And it's not that hard to do. Now sea urchins are seashells and they come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. The most common one you'll see resold to us wood turners and craft people are these pinks, the sputniks, and these big green ones right here. I do find that the sputniks sell the best. They have these little points that they're really nicely decorate, uh, nice decoration. But the first thing you need to do before you do any kind of processing with them, preparing them to become uh, a turned item, is you need to strengthen up the shells. And what I would do is I would put a heavy coat of this Mod Podge stuff on the inside of the shell. And if any of the shells, I start to see little air gaps between the different sections, because these are like eight to a dozen different mini sections, I'll drop some uh, thick CA glue on the inside so it won't show on the outside. After that, you need to process them so you can get perfect circles on all of them so your joinery will work, because they come out kind of ragged. I mean, they are seashells. What I will do is I'll take a waste block on my lathe, I'll grab it on, I'll turn down a cone, and I will wrap that cone with sandpaper. And then I will just slowly, and this is a time-consuming aspect, of grind those uh, aspects down till I get a perfect circle on either side. And you will get some kind of this Mod Podge like shredding right there, but that will be hidden once all your joinery is on there. For the pinks, the ones we're about to do now, the idea is you have one finial. You have all your decorations on it. The, the bottom of it, this distance right here, is going to get very close to the size of the larger hole, and the top is going to be made up of a slight tenon that's just going to fit perfectly on the inside. So the finial itself just kind of slides up on top of it, and you can attach to the screen right there. It is one item. It's just as quick to make as those icicles, with the exception you're adding the seashell. And to hold the seashell on, I just drizzle a little bit of hot glue on the outside and pop it on there, and it works just fine. So let's make a bunch of these smaller finial designs, and then we will talk about fitting this top section.
So there we go. I'm about halfway through the pinks. I showed you my various processes for turning the clunky finials and that such. And I hope you saw in the video. I took careful measurements of this top tenon. The one that goes through the smaller of the holes. And on the bottom hole, I just got it close to the size. I wasn't too concerned with that. Because in this design, the only weight that the seashell is having to hold up is its own weight. Unlike the Sputniks, which I'm going to show you in a second, which required two different pieces, because the shell itself is holding the entire weight of the ornament. Now this one right here, on that shelf right below the top tenon, I put a little bit of hot glue on there, slid it on the top, got the nice cool fit on it, and then kind of twisted it until the hot glue set. And that gave this a really solid glue up. And then just put the screw in there. And some of the common designs I like are this little dancer, little ballerina style one. Uh, I do a lot of these um, little OG style ones where they have a repeating theme coming through. Uh, I kind, kind of the funny ones that go over well are the wine glasses and wine bottle style ones. You can have fun with these. I think I talked about that earlier. Uh, and then just do them differently. I mean, you only have those three sections, the top, the body, and the tail to play around with. So there's a lot of variation you can do there. So let's move on to Sputniks, and I'm just going to show you the design differences, the joinery aspect of that one that set them apart. Okay, the design of our Sputniks are going to be, they're going to be in two pieces. We're going to have the finial coming down below from the small hole this time, and the upper hole, which is much larger, will hold the weight of the device and have the attachment screw on top. Now, I told you when we first processed these, when we used that cone with sandpaper wrapped around it to make the circles just a perfect circle, that the bevel we created with that cone would be important. This bevel is going to allow us that tight fit that we want, that, so the customers won't see any gaps. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to create a perfect size tenon that's going to fit down in the gap, a little bevel on either side that's probably not going to match our bevels down here perfectly, but if we make them more concave, you'll seal up the gap. And then on top, we're just going to put a small dome. I have tried in the past putting decorations on top. Don't do it, okay? It just doesn't look right. This will drop straight down in here, and then we can use our hot glue to glue this one on through the gap underneath. Now here's the kicker. On our tenon, we want to cut little recesses. That way the hot glue or the super glue we use will flow into those recesses and lock it against the side path. So real quickly, we're actually going to start making the lower tenon first. And we'll do all our decorations and stuff right there. We'll cut the recesses on that one too. And then we would do the top pieces. The reason why we're doing that one is we want to have continuous grain flowing from the base to the top. Just a little nice touch. So let's head over to the lathe and turn a quick spindle. Okay, so I chucked up another piece of maple and it's in my normal chuck, not those extended uh, jaws ones. And the size of this is important. You, you want to find the larger of your two holes and just get it a little bit bigger. Any bigger than that and you're just kind of wasting size. So it's just a tad bit bigger than the largest hole. That way as I round it down I have a little room to play with. And then we're going to start out making the finial for the small hole. So that's the tenon I'm going to shoot for, but this tenon is going to be up here. So real quickly I'm going to round it out and turn a nice little finial. sure I haven't gone too far. Yep, got plenty of room. Okay, now for the finial design. Uh, I'm just going to blast through the thickness a little bit with my rubber gouge. How about we 
do a little ball on the end this time. We're using a skewing cut to get rid of a little bit of meat. Check it out. Do I have any rough spots I want to sand out? Um, I could probably just cut that real quickly, but other than that, I, I'm good to go. So I'm just going to smooth this out real quickly. Why waste time sanding if you can cut? There we go. Maybe another coat. More cold. And now we need to make the tenon for the small section. So I'm real quickly going to measure this so I can set the depth of my tenon right there. Just kind of eyeball the thickness with my little gauge. So I've got my measurement. I've kind of eyeballed it. It doesn't really have to be a piston fit into these things. It can be a little bit loose and the super glue with those little ridges will take care of it. So there's my setting right there. Kind of eyeball how thick it's going to be. And then go for it. Always go way too thick your first few times so that because it's always easier to remove wood than put it back on. So now that I got a fit where it's not pressing against the load dividers, okay. 
remember we have a slightly downhill angle right there it's not much so I now want to create that angle at the base of that tenon right there so I'm just going to come in kind of eyeball that angle and have at it there we go now that's probably a little bit steeper but I can guarantee that it will fit up flush against that right there now you can just shape the rest of your the head of this however you want go. Now here is the key point. Now that I've got my tenon made, I'm going to come in with my skew and I'm going to make some V-cuts. That right there gives the wood a, a place to go in. I mean the super glue a place to sink in and really lock these finials onto the sputniks. So from here, just chop it off. There we go. You don't have to be too pretty about that. So let's test out the fit. Oh yeah, that's going to work out very nicely. So now we want to work on the side right here. So the first thing I need to do is make a tenon to fit this. I don't bother measuring here because you can kind of eyeball it and just kind of trial and error till it gets the right fit. Just slides right on there. Still a little too much. You use this as a slight skew, you, kinda, you can angle it down to see where it's going to fit right. See right there, it just slides on just perfectly. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to cut it down to that size. Just like that. Then once again, I'm going to taper it. little V cuts. Just like that. So from here just knock it off, give yourself a little room. Then you can take the chuck off. Okay, so I'm reverting back to my smaller jaws and just kind of securing it in there. It doesn't have to be too tight because we're just going to be very, taking very light cuts at this point. And we're going to smooth out the face. You can just use the wing of your blade as a scraping cut. Remember me talking about understanding your angles. Let's just work our way down. I'm doing this cut because all my force is going towards the chuck right now and I don't have that much pressure against it. We're just going to create a nice little dome. And come in and clean up the edge just ever so slightly. One last cleaning cut. 
nice and smooth. Look for those shavings to make sure you're getting a nice clean cut. And to make sure that the little screw goes in tightly, I like to don't just hollow out just a little spot right in the center to help me center that lead screw. There we go. So the first thing I do is put the, the screw that's going to allow you to put it onto the tree into the top section. And I just hold them with a pair of vice grips just because my grip's not too big. And it's just that little metal screw. Find that center point and just kind of screw it in. I have found it easier to twist the top than to push in and twist the screw because sometimes the screw just doesn't want to lead through. So once that's done, you have the option. You can go ahead and apply your finishes as you want now. If you're going to put oil on it, let them set for a day or two. But what I like to do is I will just take my Sputnik, put the little cap on it, turn it over, and I literally just dump hot glue into the interior of the seashell. It doesn't have to be too much just enough to set it up. Give that a few seconds and while that's working I grab my super glue drizzle some super glue on the rim of the seashell and try and get some on the inside so it's just dangling off and it's nice and wet that way when you seat the shit this finny on it and turn it upside down that super glue will kind of fall down into the crevices. And just give it a few seconds to harden up. And I generally do these in batches. So I'll do all these, then I'll, do all, I'll glue all the tops, go down the road, then put in all the bases, go down the road. And then I have a little tiny brush where I can come in and put finish on at this point in time simply because I'm in a hurry and it's easier for me to be delicate with my oil now than it is to wait a day or two for this stuff to dry because I, I have a market tomorrow and I want to get these out. Wipe it off the excess. Do the same for the base. And call it done. It'll dry overnight and this oil will be won't be tacky in the morning. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, it really does help us out. If you would like, favorite, subscribe, do all those social medias. Visit our website, WorthEffort.com, where I have a lot of swag, including these custom t-shirts, hats, that kind of stuff, and a lot of the bigger projects that we do uh, to sell art markets, I also feature on our web store. And all those sales really does help me out because buying materials to make these videos and setting aside time to do the editing really does bite into my production work. So, if you want to see more videos like this, or want, you have some special ideas of something you might like to see in a small production run for us artists to do, uh, please leave it in the comments below. And I want you to remember one last thing. It is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.